And now I'll invite Paul from AMP. Please give him a big hand. Thank you very much. So what we're going to talk about today is just thinking about the perspective of all of us here. We can think of ourselves as the customer of many possible functions. In a way, we've, we've got our challenges in the world today, but technology and just development in general have allowed us to flourish at a level never before possible, and that presents just a lot of choice. We can entertain ourselves, we can educate ourselves, we can grow our careers, we can pursue material well-being. There's so many things we can do, and there's so many businesses in the world that are trying to get our attention as a way of helping us achieve the value we want. And the nature of that relationship between technology and us as humans trying to achieve our ends is the way is the sort of the pivot and the thesis that I want to talk about today. Let me introduce myself real quickly. I'm CEO and one of the co-founders of AMP. AMP provides what we call agentic AI infrastructure for consumer businesses. My background, I, I've spent my career at the intersection of cognitive science and thinking about how we make decisions cognitively as people within co social cognition, within social contexts. The intersection of that and machine learning systems, especially in the context of consumer technology, left a career in research. I was last at, at Harvard and Cambridge in working in implicit social cognition and then left to go into technology to build applications. I previously co-founded a fintech app in India and grew up to be one of the largest non-banking mobile lenders in the market. It was acquired in 2019 and then continued to grow and flourish. And then we start, started AMP with two other neuroscientists after that. AMP's backed by Theory Ventures here in SF, as well as Peak 15, which was formerly Sequoia in Southeast Asia, Z47, which was formerly Matrix in India. We're used by a bunch of apps, we're going quite fast. But I'm not going to talk too much about AMP per se. I want to talk about is the problems that we're trying to solve for when we think about the nature of the interaction between an application and an end customer. As marketers, we're trying to guide that process. And so what is our role and what is the role of the technology and what is the actual problem to be solved? And so one of the core problems is that to get attention today, given everything else that a person can pay attention to, you've got to be relevant, you've got to be specific. We use another term, which is you've got to be personalized, right? And really just, that just means specific, relevant, contextual to a given person. And it's not a new concept or a new term. We all know we need this kind of thing. Traditionally, how that manifests is in things like inserting a name into a particular message or surface, trying to find a particular SKU or category of SKUs that's relevant for someone, having some kind of context where a message is triggered by an action a user takes within an application. Most of those are defined by rules that marketers set. They say, this is the situation, this is the context, and this is what should be done. And the result, as we all know, is that most experiences are not very personal, not very specific and contextual. And when you dive into that, you can see all the problems where it fails. Now, why are we in that position is because of an artifact of the way we've been building software for the first 20 to 30 years of building software. If you just look at that trajectory of consumer technology and consumer software, as we've moved from desktop applications to web-based applications to mobile applications, the actual interface of the application itself, the UI and the UX, and the messaging have remained fairly constant in the sense that they're designed by human teams who set up a bunch of rules and say, under this condition, send this message, under this condition, if a user opens the app, show them this home page. Now what we're moving into is what we call software 2.0, where we don't need to run the applications based on rules that we preset. The infrastructure for the software itself can begin to have the agency to modulate itself and respond to people to learn directly from them and then create a malleable experience that is responsive to a particular person. So what does that look like in practice? What we begin to get UIs that are reshaped, presentation layouts. As people, we don't just learn through language. We learn through presentation structured information. That's why UIs are so important. I think that's why they don't go away in a world of AI. But what happens is that the actual UI and layouts and the structure of those applications themselves become dynamic. Now for that to happen, what you need is for an agent to be able to learn at the level of a user, at the sub-level of why am I talking about food, for example. So traditionally you would say, oh, this person might like a burger, 
But what the person actually wants is to eat something high in protein so they can gain weight, or to eat something low in calories so they can lose weight, or to eat something that's sustainably sourced and environmentally friendly because that is in line with your values, or just eat something sloppily delicious. There's many different ways to frame that same product, and that is what it means to be contextual because you're trying to further that person's ends. If the application wants to further the person's ends, it has to have a way of understanding them. And so it does that by instrumenting communication in whatever UI context you're talking about, really at that level of detail. What AMP does, we argue, is necessary for that to happen, is to be able to provision an agent for every end user. So this is not a functional agent, it's not a retention agent versus an acquisition agent. It's an agent that's specific to an end user, that follows that user, that can learn by interacting with that users, and then comparing their notes with other agents. So there's an element of orchestration. And that agent has to have a reference point to all the different variables. When I speak, when I show you a presentation, when I show you a particular surface, there's a lot that's going in there. And an agent has to be able to deconstruct it so they can recombine it in a way that, again, is specific to you. It's not just important to talk about the burger, it's to talk about the burger being high in protein or, again, sloppily delicious. And so that's what end up happening is we move from a world of one particular message or one particular screen and we generate hundreds and thousands of possible screens. We generate hundreds of thousands of possible messages. Now, you could go straight to actually generated text, but what that does is miss the problem. This is an architectural limitation of a language model. We don't need to get into the technical details, but you have to encode that knowledge in order to be able to match it and learn. You need a kind of semantic space in between. And that is the problem the agent's solving that traditionally, as humans, we were very limited in our ability to solve, is to say, wait a second, how do I deconstruct what I'm talking about here and reassemble the version that's best for a particular user or reassemble a version that's allowing to us to understand something about that user? And so there's a module of policy selection process here where the, the work to be done is the agent to actually track those individual variants. And then to have a reference based on the semantic space for that end user. So it's not an abstract, it can't be invisible to the manager. So one of our largest customers in Southeast Asia runs on the order of over 100 million agents in a month with us through their application. You don't want 100 million conversations that you don't have any track of. You want to be able to interpret it, strategically manage it. That's what the marketer's job becomes, is management. And so the underlying infrastructure has to enable that management. It has to be able to say, here are the dimensions on which these conversations are taking place. The agents themselves have to have the context. So if you're working with a UI UX, the agent has to have a way of using the tools that are available to us as designers and marketers, things like Figma, to actually extract the design context so that then they can modulate it going forward. So it's just like a lot of these technical work that has to be done within the agent user relationship. And then what happens is the marketers become managers of strategic topics and contexts. And they're sorting it out. You're not writing a single message for a user. You're thinking about all the possible vectors of a conversation of a topic. We're thinking about the fact that food delivery, for example, can be connected to weather. So you can pull in weather APIs where there's a reference to, is it raining in your area, given your device ID? And maybe there's an NBA game playing. And so you can pull in a reference to that as you nudge them towards ordering pizza or whatever they're going to do. And then I guess I'll just wrap up with, does it work? We, we presented a paper just at the ACM Recommender Systems Conference in Prague two weeks ago showing some of the work we've done with a large multi-market super app in Southeast Asia. And, and the results are quite exciting and, and energizing for them, for us. For this app, working across multiple features, driving GMV increases on those features between 11 and 40%. And you can look at that at every level of the conversion process. So the key thing, though, is just that what we're saying is Software itself is the way we write it and manage it is changing. And that has implications for the way we manage as marketers and the job that marketers do in order to drive value for end users in a very busy, crowded world. Any questions? Hello. Yep. Yep. My name is Roger. I run a branding agency. And I was interested to know, and just a question on whether this kind of technology used in ads would 
potentially dilute brand messaging because if everything's being reconfigured in the view of the user, it could dilute differentiation if everyone's being shown what they want to see. Everybody being shown what they want to see, I would argue, is the best form of differentiation. I think there are guidelines. I think there are definitions of who you want to be in the world that you can follow. So for example, when we're working with a large streaming app and it's trying to tell you about movies, the ownership of the depiction of that movie is determined by the IP holder, right? So it's the actor or the movie studio that owns that, right? So they can say, for example, you may look at Terminator as it's funny, right? It's silly depiction of the future or something like that. Right? But they may decide, I never want Arnold Schwarzenegger to be referred to in an ironic way. He is an action hero. Right? So you can always set the bounds on how an agent can portray something uh, that are in line with your business's values or guidelines. Definitely regulatorily this is important. Right? But whatever you define those bounds, there's always going to be room for exploration within those bounds. Right? Th these are all the acceptable ways our brand can be conveyed. And then what you need to be is specific to that user. You need to find the form of it that's best for that person. Because ultimately, that person doesn't care about your brand. They care about their value, what they're trying to achieve in the world. And then they develop an affinity for your brand when your brand consistently adds value to them. So that's, yes, definitely set guidelines. But within those guidelines, you're really trying to drive value for the end user. Hi. Another question? Yeah. How are you? So this is brilliant on the level of information and images, and then there whatever commu is communicated actually to the customer. But then on the level of UX itself, because this is also something that's very important, the technical restriction now is they can, you can only do that on, through A-B testing, right? Yeah. Whether this is one box here or one box that. But how can you get into the universe of hundreds or like 1,000 different variations of UX per customer? I, I may have misinterpreted your question, but let me start by saying A-B testing is absolutely not the technology you want to use here because by definition it is not at a user level and also it is an aggregate that isn't tracking all of the dimensions of the test. Not to mention the fact that the notion of statistical significance and other things like that are quite defunct as a measurement technology and as a statistical inference technology. So that aside, rant aside, and you can find lots on our blog and other things like that, ultimately the scalability of the variant space, of the action space, is to some degree constrained by the rate of interaction and the number of people and then the diversity of those people within the context that you're serving them. That rate can be learned by the agents themselves far faster and better than we can designing controlled statistical experiments. So I would try to turn it around and say the obstacle that you're describing is actually the benefit of the way of solving the problem. And that's true for UX layouts as it is for copy. The present, and then this is actually why I'm so bullish on applications in general that are not like chatbot linear kind of conversations. Natural language is an incredibly granular technology as humans that we use. I think approximately there's about 180,000 words active in the English language. Why are there so many words? Because three dimensions, the world is grit, rich, it's textured, it's granular. We have to get very specific. But the challenge of that specificity is that I can say something and you heard something completely different and that happens all of the time. Right? And so the reason we rely on visual technology, like visual layout, structured information, it allows us to have less loss in the interaction. So anyway, so that means that I can present information in one way or another way, and then I can learn for you specifically, how are you responding to it? Is it meaningful? Is it valuable? But you can do that by measuring, it's more like reinforcement learning, kind of contextual, things like that, rather than an A-B test. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Paul. Yeah. That was awesome. I think fantastic. Appreciate it. I think definitely leading edge is up going on.